All right, well, good morning. I hope everybody is doing well, and I hope I did not get you up under the anticipation of any big announcement or anything. I absolutely have no agenda. Just thought um, now that the fall semester was behind us and we're in the throes of our spring semester and it will be a very busy spring season that how to give you guys a, a little bit of an update and an opportunity to ask me some questions. So um, one of the things I wanted to, to start with, um, I'll, I'll call it my why. Um, back in July, late July, when there was a lot of scrutiny on, around whether or not we should play a fall sports season or an athletic season in general, um, I got really frustrated with the narrative that was out there about why we were playing a season or at least attempting to play a season. And uh, so in my frustration, I wrote an open letter uh, that I ended up not sending out, but I think it was very therapeutic for me. And um, I wanted to take some excerpts from that and read that to you right now. Um, so this starts somewhat in the middle. I've had the privilege during my 10 plus years as a director of athletics to live out my passion at the FCS level at Coastal Carolina University, the Group of Five level at the University of Houston, and now the Autonomy Five level at the University of Arkansas. The resources available to invest in the experience and overall development of the student athletes has changed dramatically at each stop, as has my personal compensation. But what has never changed is my why. This why is the same reason I'm pushing daily within our department conference and nationally for division one athletics to be played this fall. That why is our student athletes. Right now at the University of Arkansas, we have 325 student athletes on campus representing 19 different sports who have returned voluntarily to work on their passion. They came back to do what they love, to lift weights, run, shoot, pass, hit, dribble, pitch, serve, volley, drive, dive and swim. They came back to enjoy the camaraderie of being surrounded by their fellow teammates during one of the most special times of their lives. Student athletes are making incredible sacrifices to provide themselves the best opportunity to have a season. As such, I will continue to work tirelessly to find a way that includes the safety, health and well-being of our student athletes, staff and fans to play college athletics this year at the University of Arkansas. Sure, there are financial ramifications to such decisions that will play an integral role in our ability to continue to support our student athletes at the level we have been able to in the past. However, this season, as is the case for every season, my why continues to be the same, our incredible student athletes. And I just wanna tip my hat to our student athletes as we're about halfway through this athletic season. Uh, to date, since June the 1st, yesterday, we just went over 18,000 COVID tests among our student athlete, coaches and support staff population. We've got a positivity rate below 1.2%. Currently among our 12 sports that are competing, we have zero positive cases of COVID among those 12 sports. We've had the opportunity to compete in 91 events to date, and we've competed successfully in 90 of those 91 events. Our bowl game in Texas being the only event to date that has been canceled. Uh, we were able to make up the Tulsa men's basketball game, and we just rescheduled the Vanderbilt women's basketball game to get to that 90 of 91%. Um, and not only um, have we competed, we've competed successfully both on and off the field. Uh, this, this fall semester, our student athletes had a fall term GPA of 3.22, and we had 17 of our 19 sports programs that had an average GPA of 3.0 or better. During 2020, we had 104 student athletes that graduated or earned their degree from the University of Arkansas. Uh, as all of you know, we won three SEC championships. We have eight teams that were been ranked in the top 15 or above and 12 in the top 25. And we've been able to have fans at all of our events successfully, except for indoor track and field events. And the other residual effect of having this is each of you, the, the members of the media get to cover their, those events. Our ushers, our ticket takers, our concession workers get to work those events. And so, um, my why is our student athletes, 
but by having competitive athletic competition this fall and into this spring um, is why we're doing what we're doing um, because it benefits so many people um, across our university community, across our state and really nationally. Can you imagine? Um, I remember back to what March, April and May were like without college athletics and I don't ever wanna go through, through that again. So with that, I'm gonna stop right there, Kyle, and just open it up for questions on any topic. There's nothing that's not on the table. I may not answer your question, but you can ask it. Bob, you wanna lead us off? Sure, hey Hunter, how you doing? Thanks for doing it. Hey Bob. Um, I had a couple basketball questions. Um, one, you know, speaking of postponements and whatnot, you know, Vandy, from what you know or what you've been communicated with, um, is the basketball game uh, going to be played Saturday? And do you communicate with the Vandy folks or does that go through the SEC or how, how does that work? There's a combination of the two. The basketball sport administrators for us as Clayton Hamilton will be in communication with their basketball sport administrator as well as the league office. And as of last night, I haven't gotten an update this morning, but that game was still on, Bob. Okay. And then I know you were at the game last night. I assume you're probably at all of them. Um, what was going through your mind when it's, you know, Arkansas is struggling down 19? You know, I remember thinking, man, I hope Eric, you know, makes it through this game because he's so emotional. Um, what was going through your mind? And then what did you think about the comeback? And what do you think about the job Eric's doing in his second season? I think he's doing a great job, Bob. And, uh, and I'll answer your first question. Obviously, in the first half, um, after watching the, the majority of the LSU game and the Alabama game, our offense has been struggling. And I think it's definitively a, a confidence problem. And I think with Justin out, you saw teams really cheat out on our three-point shooters, and we were not able to finish at the basket. Uh, but really what turned the corner for us is that our one returning player with any significant minutes from last year, Desi Seals had a heck of a game, especially in the second half for us last night. And uh, we need Desi to be that glue that holds us together, and that's a lot of pressure on him. I mean, look at our players that had significant minutes last year. Uh, Mason Jones is in the NBA. Isaiah Joe's in the NBA. Jimmy Witt's in the G League. Adriel Bailey's playing overseas, and uh, we've got four freshmen uh, that are learning as they go. We've got some transfers, um, and we've done that. Uh, we've got a virtually new team during COVID where we haven't been able to do the normal bonding thing. So I think the job Eric has done, I think he spoiled us at the beginning of the season. When you think about how many new players we had by getting off to the start, and then when you get into SEC competition, it steps up a little bit, and I think you see – a team like Alabama has two or three senior leaders in that starting lineup that are pulling along the freshmen and sophomores. And so um, we needed some confidence last night in the second half, and we got it. And I hope that continues this Saturday in Nashville, Bob. Nate? Yeah, Heather, as far as you had uh, to replace uh, with, because of what you inherited and, and then the COVID, we had to re uh, get early retirement from about decades of institutional knowledge on the support staff. How's it gone replacing that uh, so far? Well, we're never going to be able to replace that institutional knowledge, Nathan. You're referring to the 16 uh, staff members that had close to 500 years of service to our department. You just can't replace that. Uh, we miss those people dearly around their department, their personality, um, and their knowledge. But um, you know, we've been able to forge ahead and, and people have stepped up and covered those duties that were left behind. Also, as far as, as I mean, what, what is it financial that you've inherited? And the SEC has always been a keep up with the Jones League with building. Does that change now with, with uh, COVID? Are there be kind of less ambitious plans, you think, throughout the league? I, I don't see there being less ambitious plans within the SEC. I mean, th th this year... Um, has been a struggle for most of us financially, but uh, you, you can see what we, you know, the baseball facility, the, the JB and John L. Hunt Family Baseball Development Center is on schedule and will open, part of that will open at the start of baseball season. The other part will open uh, during baseball season. Our Frank O'Meara uh, Track and Field High Performance Center will open in April and a, a major renovation to the Tyson Indoor uh, just was debuted this past weekend. And so I, I don't think the ambitious nature of the SEC uh, will go away because of COVID. Tom. 
Hey, Hunter, that funnels right into what I wanted to ask you. Um, the numbers from the fall season, particularly football, how do they look for you uh, in terms of uh, overall, you know, expenses and, and revenues and where you're headed? Sure, Tom. I think the last time we gathered together and we talked about our budget, um, we were anticipating a deficit somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 to $25 million on the revenue side. Uh, that's probably closer to 25 to $30 million after we've closed out football season. We're roughly halfway through uh, basketball season and we kind of feel like we know what we're going to be able to do with baseball season. So uh, we're, we've had to make a few adjustments to our budget uh, on the expense side because of those anticipated uh, revenue shortfalls growing, uh, but we feel like we're in really good shape still. All things okay. considered. Uh, and also, you guys are advertising for a senior AD for uh, name, image, and likeness stuff. And I wanted to ask you about the, the position and spending that kind of money right now when you're in that kind of financial situation. Sure. I mean, the, the name, image, and, and likeness train is coming down the, the track uh, quickly, even though that was tabled at last week's NCAA meetings. Um, there's still state legislation um, in many states across our country. We believe there'll be federal legislation that, that's coming. Uh, many schools have invested in a third party company to manage that for them. I thought it was a better resource for our student athletes to have someone internal uh, that could help them manage the launch of the, the name, image, and likeness and their brand building. And so that, that's why we're making that investment right now, Tom. Okay, Betty. You're going to love this crystal ball question, but if you can, after this spring semester, looking ahead to, I guess, August, fall 2021, what are your, what are your hopes? What do you think things could be like uh, as far as attendance for fans and things like that? Crystal ball. Yeah, Trey, I mean, we're going to launch our, our football season ticket campaign late February, um, early March with the anticipation of having full capacity at Razorback Stadium. Um, we're, we're going to sell it that way. We'll release our football schedule here uh, through the SEC office in the next uh, week to 10 days. Um, but we're anticipating things returning to some sense of normalcy. Um, and that's my crystal ball outlook of what I think right now. Thank you there. One question today. Yeah, sorry, my computer skipped. Um, Hunter, uh, in terms of the uh, coaching turnover situation with football, how do you think Sam Pittman handled, uh, you know, some of his coaches being called away for interviews and just how he handled that, all that in the in the background? I think he's done a great, great job managing that. I mean, obviously, um, you know, Barry Odom was a hot commodity after how our defense played for the majority of the season and having been a former head coach. I mean, it was important for Coach Pittman that we retained um, <clears throat> Coach Odom. We were able to do that. I think we filled our void uh, that was created at our wide receiver spot with Justin Stepp leaving to South Carolina. That was really for him to have the opportunity to return home. Uh, Kenny Guyton will fill that really, really well for us. And so I think Sam has managed uh, people coming after his staff uh, very, very well. Gotti? Yeah, Hunter, I guess you just mentioned Barry Odom, but I guess just how important was it, you know, just for the direction of the football program to, to keep Barry on board? It was very important. It, um, you know, Barry has that experience as sitting in that head coaching chair in the Southeastern Conference that has been invaluable to Coach Pittman throughout this year and will be invaluable moving forward. Our defensive student athletes, the student athletes on the defensive side of the ball, love him. He obviously created schemes uh, that put us in a position to have some success um, throughout the, the season. And he's an important piece to our puzzle. And just continuity in general with among your coaching staff is very, very important. And to be able to retain uh, both of your, or really all three of our coordinators, how Sam has that set up with uh, Coach Bryles and Coach Fountain um, <clears throat> and Coach Odom was very, very important. Let me know if you've got more questions in the chat. Trey Schapp. Hey, Hunter, I know it's been a struggle for all athletic directors across the country, but for you at Arkansas, what has kept you up at night as you contemplate tough decisions? COVID test results, Trey. <laughs> Quite honestly, I mean, um, 
that's just the ability to continue to compete in games. I mean, um, you know, there was a significant value um, anytime we would have lost an SEC football game um, on that from a television revenue standpoint. And um, we're already um, hemorrhaging a, a great deal of revenue right now. We didn't want to lose more revenue. It's just, you know, how do we, you know, we have not um, laid any of our staff members off. We did have the early retirement. Um, everybody has taken a pay cut, but uh, we have not had to lay any of our employees off or, or terminate any employment within our department and taking care of our staff, taking care of our student athletes. That, that's what keeps me up tonight as an athletic director and being able to maintain what we're doing. Hutch? Yeah, Hunter, back to football, you know, considering all the obstacles that came with the pandemic, were you at all surprised at how quickly or, and how much Coach Pittman got the, the program turned around this year? Uh, absolutely. He, he exceeded my expectations. When you think about bringing a new staff on board and, and then roughly 65 to 70 days after that, um, you have you go into kind of a COVID situation like we did. You cancel spring practice. You're meeting virtually. You're trying to install offenses and defenses virtually uh, during the spring. You have limited workout availability during the months of, of June and early part of July. Um, he, came, he and his staff overcame a number of obstacles uh, to really create a, a level of confidence amongst our student athletes that they were going to be put in positions to have success. And then you put on top of that uh, an SEC only schedule where, you know, I, I still think it was one of the toughest schedules in the history of college football. We played four teams that were in uh, New Year's Six Bowl games and they played obviously the eventual national champion in Alabama and to win three of those games. And we haven't won three SEC games in the last three years. I think that was a significant accomplishment and step in the right direction for our program. And then along those same lines, you know, when you hired a, a guy with no head coaching experience, you know, the hire was kind of met with criticism and skepticism nationally. What, how did you enjoy personally the success they had? And I mean, did it, did you feel almost kind of vindicated with, with how well they did? Well, you know, I try not to pay attention to a lot of the scrutiny that goes on in hiring coaches. Um, I felt like Sam Pittman was a great fit for what we needed at the University of Arkansas uh, with his ability to build offensive and defensive lines, his ability to recruit, and uh, just his personality and how it fit within our state. And so uh, I felt like he was going to be successful. To say that he was going to be successful out of the gate like he was um, with all the obstacles we overcame, you know, I would be lying to you if I said that. But uh, I thought Sam Pittman, I wouldn't have hired him if I didn't think he's the right person for the job. Um, Hunter, this is a state of the baseball program question. Um, the 4,000 in attendance, uh, is there a temptation to maybe try to bump that up and can you adjust it higher as the summer goes along? And secondly, Dave's just taken on everybody in the state he can. And I want to get your thoughts on, on that part of it too. Yeah, no, absolutely, Tom. I mean, part of the uh, the method to the madness that our external team developed and how we're selling tickets to baseball was to sell them on a single game basis uh, that'll make it much easier to increase that capacity in, in various areas of the stadium uh, as the spring season goes on, if we have that ability through the Arkansas Department of Health and as COVID hopefully uh, becomes a, a thing that's in our rear view mirror. So, um, we hope that that 4,218 roughly that uh, that that will grow um, over the course of the spring. And that's why we set up the, the, the single game ticket purchasing the way the way we have, um, you know, Dave <clears throat> in, in his schedule. I mean, he's always been one to take on all comers, but um, it, it just makes sense. And it's why we went down this path of playing state schools. It's easy for these schools to bust over and play midweek baseball games. Um, it makes sense. Uh, for us to play those uh, in-state schools, especially in a sport like baseball and softball. And, um, you know, Dave's done a great job of scheduling. I think he's got all of them on the schedule now. Yeah. And the senior AD position you're hiring, when do you expect that to happen? And in a nutshell, what, what will that person do? Yeah, so that, that position actually closes, I think, uh, tomorrow. And then we hope to have that person in place uh, by um the early part of March to late March. Um, and really, you know, that's the helping our student athletes from the time they arrive on campus, uh, one, build their brand. I mean, all of our student athletes have a brand and that's really what name, image and likeness is. It's, um, it's about the student athletes personal brand. 
and we want to, to teach them how to build their brand, to build their brand through um, social media and the, the do's and don'ts about social media. Uh, we want to give them the appropriate legal advice as they um, try to go out and name, image, and likeness. We want to make sure they're compliant with what's going on. So I really, my, you know, this is kind of a blank canvas for us, but my vision for this position is that they uh, really help our student athletes from their freshman year to their senior year uh, build a solid brand uh, that is a benefit to student athletes throughout their life. And if it's a financial benefit for them while they're here at the University of Arkansas, so be it. Seth? Yeah, Hunter, uh, Mike Neighbors and women's basketball team has made sure that, you know, he wants to lead the country in games played. He said that. Uh, what went into replacing a game in basically a week and getting such a great opponent? Yeah, so uh, Mike Neighbors, um, he, he sent a text to me when Vanderbilt dropped out of the season and, and wanted to know if uh, he could replace Vanderbilt with Connecticut. Um, quite honestly, I thought he was kidding. When he sent me that text, um, he was dead serious. He said, um, he said, I've talked to our team. They want to play the best. They enjoyed competing against Baylor. They enjoyed competing against South Carolina and the rigors of the SEC schedule. Connecticut had lost, uh, I think, four or five games uh, early in the season. They were looking for games, and it just uh, it made a great deal of sense to try to get them here. Jordan? Hey, Hunter. When you talk hey, about Jordan. the low positivity rate that you all have had, is there anything that you can – attribute to maybe that success when you see so many other programs around the country having to cancel things and having all of these positive cases? Is there anything in particular you're noticing? Well, I think our coaches and our athletic trainers, our strength conditioning coaches, our nutritionists that are around our student athletes on a regular basis are continuing to do a great job reinforcing uh, those messages to our student athletes about the appropriate behavior um, not only when they're in our facilities, which is really easy for us to manage, but it's when they go back to their apartments and they're going out to eat. And I think our student athletes, they want to compete in their sports. They invest a great deal of time um, in training and want to play their sports. And as you look at our spring sports that had their seasons cut short last year, um, and we're heading into that spring season, they're all taking it extremely seriously. Now we have 18 of 19 of our sports programs that will compete this spring and our football program will, is the 19th and they'll have a spring uh, football season. So just about every one of our student athletes is competing this spring. And I think they do see Jordan what's happening around the country and they don't want to be one of those schools that cancels games or postpones games. Matt. Hey Hunter, I wanted to go back to something you said earlier about uh, the baseball facility, you said part would be ready uh, during the season and part after the season. I wonder if you could give a little bit more detail what you're talking about and, and when it's going to be fully operational. Yeah, so uh, Matt, it was our goal to have the 14 loge boxes. It's that outdoor seating area that's adjacent to what right now is the visiting team bullpen. So it's 14 loge boxes. There's two five person loge boxes and 12 four person loge boxes. Uh, those will be completed here in the next couple of weeks, and those will be uh, open uh, for opening day of the baseball season. The remainder of the facility uh, will not be completed in some until sometime um, mid to late April. And so that's what I mean by some of that facility will be open. Do you think that means that the team will be using it before the end of the season, or do you think it'll be after the season if they get in there? But, you know, I haven't had that conversation with Coach Van Horn. Obviously, we're not going to switch dugouts or switch bullpens during the, the middle of the season. Um, and whether they go out, out to that facility in, in May and use the weight room, training room, things of that nature, that's still yet to be determined. But, you know, trying to move from our current clubhouse out there during the middle of the season may be problematic. But, you know, I'll leave that up to Coach uh, Van Horn if he wants to make that decision to move during the season. Coach? Hunter, I'm not sure if this is something you'll be able to answer, but I know in Coach Pittman's contract, it has some like automatic raises built in if he reaches certain thresholds of wins. Uh, they went three and seven, but I think in a normal year, everyone thinks they probably would have won six games with a non-conference schedule. Is that something that y'all have discussed and have been in consideration this offseason? Um, it has. Coach Pittman and I have discussed uh, some parameters within his current contract on multiple times. And we're working through uh, some of those. And I think you'll see something here in the next so, 
related to that, Hutch? Bob? Yeah, Hunter, you cut out there. You said you'd see something in the next and then? Probably uh, in the next month. OK. Um, that wasn't my original question, but I wanted to clarify that. Hey, getting back to finances, I'm sure Texas and LSU, whoever else uh, was trying to get Barry, you know, they threw a lot of money at him. With the financial challenges you guys are facing, how hard was it to come up with the money, added money to retain Barry? And then it's great to get these seniors back, but that's extra money too. I mean, you guys could have, you know, pushing 95 players on scholarship. How, yeah. how challenging is that? Yep. Bob, um, when I let Coach uh, Morris go, I anticipated that we were going to have some financial hardships prior to COVID just because we were going to have to pay Coach Morris out. That was no longer the, the, the foundation responsibility. We had Coach Chavis and a couple other coaches in retainer. And I went out um, and met with several of our donors and created through our Razorback Foundation what I called the Football Enhancement Fund that would provide uh, Coach Pittman um, the opportunity to spend those resources uh, to hire and retain the best coaches, to uh, buy any type of equipment he needed for the Smith Center and to recruit uh, where that didn't have to come from a, an operational budget. And then when COVID hit, it was more than uh, necessary. And so um, the, the raises that <clears throat> were given to, to Coach Odom and, and any of his other staff members, they're coming right now, for at least for the next two years, uh, from that football enhancement fund, not coming from any operational dollars. And, and there's... The, 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 having the extra players back, that's great for Sam, but it's more money you got to spend. But how is how big a challenge is that? Uh, and that's just not for football. I mean, that's for all of our sports. Um, you know, that that's happened um, now for all of our fall sports and all of our winter sports. And so that that's a challenge that we're going to have to address uh, with all of our sports moving forward. It's got one more. The open letter. Were you were you pl originally planning to like send that to season ticket holders or post it on Twitter? And then what what else? What, what, why did you decide not to post it? Uh, yes and yes, and um, you know I think I decided not to post it just because I wrote it, sat on it for a day or two, as um, some mentors have told me. When you write some things in haste, whether it's an email, a text message, or things, you, need, you sit on it for twenty four to forty eight hours, um, and just decided that. Uh, it had kind of served its purpose for me and it'd been very therapeutic for me to write that and, and read it uh, multiple times. Okay, thanks. All right, last call. All right, Trey Shep, wrap us up. Hey, Hunter, right before Christmas, you uh, gifted Kane and Sandy with lifetime season tickets to any athletic event at the University of Arkansas. What, it, what went into that decision? Well, you know, I was not aware of the fact that Kane and, and his mom kind of uh, called multiple people to try to scrounge up a couple of tickets so that they could attend games. And I, I thought they were just season ticket holders and had the wherewithal to do that and was amazed that they could. And then when I found out that the, they didn't have that wherewithal and uh, that they were having to call, you know, friends and and people within our department to try to find tickets to all the events they wanted to come to. I just thought it was a natural thing to do to um, one of our super fans who um, has obviously not had the easiest life uh, to just give him the opportunity um, as a Christmas present to attend Razorback events with his mom for life. And so um, had all of our coaches sign uh, that commemorative ticket for Canaan. And um, I mean, I think you saw <clears throat> the video with him crying, his mom crying, um, and what that really meant to them. And not only what it meant to them, we're really, um, I was overwhelmed by what it meant to our fan base. Um, because I don't know that anybody that's a true Razorback fan that doesn't know who Cannon Sandy is. All right, that'll wrap us up. Hunter, appreciate the time. All right, thank you. You guys have a great week and weekend. Go Hogs. Thanks, Hunter.